Make sure you listen to what I say. I may be stupid or quite naive. <웃음> 끝없이 쏟아지는 포터 스파. 휴대폰 한 대로 감당할 수 있겠니? Good evening. It's 9 p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. South Korea is expanding remote clinical services via video or phone as part of extended efforts to tackle the ongoing medical disruption amid the doctor's walkout. Meanwhile, President Yoon Song yeol shows his intent to talk to the protesting doctors himself. Our Choi Soo-hyung leads us off. Amid the ongoing dispute over an increase in the medical school enrollment quota, the government has also decided to temporarily expand telemedicine services to local public health centers across South Korea. During Wednesday's briefing, the government said the measure is part of an emergency medical system to fill potential medical service gaps in certain areas like islands. The health ministry said diagnosis and prescriptions for minor illnesses can be obtained at 246 public health centers nationwide. The current procedures for non-face-to-face -face medical care, such as sending prescriptions to pharmacies, will apply equally. This will make it more convenient for people who have been using local public health centers for purposes such as health care management and prevention. Furthermore, the government will go forward with a plan to increase the number of full-time professors in medical schools nationwide by 1,000 by 2027. Meanwhile, South Korea's presidential office said Tuesday that President Yoon Sagar wishes to meet with the junior doctors directly to engage in constructive dialogue, adding that the office is always open to the Korean citizens. The health ministry echoed those sentiments, calling on doctors to engage in talks and suggest reasonable measures for cooperation. The president wants to meet with doctors who are involved in collective action and hear directly from them. The government asked the medical community to engage in communication so that reasonable discussions can take place. Following Yoon's proposal on Tuesday, the Medical Professors Association of Korea said that the president is the only one who can make a breakthrough in the conflict. The MPAK also asked the president to meet with junior doctors unconditionally. However, despite continued appeals from the government, doctors have yet to respond. So far, there have been no reports of trainee doctors returning to their hospitals and only 10 percent of the interns newly accepted this year had registered by Tuesday, the deadline for the new employment registration. Choi soo -hyung, Arirang News. South Korean construction firms Samsung ENA and GSENC have won a mega deal to expand a gas plant in Saudi Arabia worth billions of dollars, the largest secured by Korean companies in the Middle East. Our Shin se reports. Samsung ENA and GSENC have won a combined 7.2 billion US dollar deal to expand a gas plant in Saudi Arabia. Samsung's construction norm announced Wednesday that it had been successful in securing $6 billion worth of contracts for packages number one and number four for the Fat Healy gas plant expansion project from Saudi Arabia's state-owned oil company Aramco, the largest project a South Korean construction firm has ever secured in the Middle East country. 
These packages involve building a gas processing plant and utility and additional facilities. GSENC also begged an order worth $1.2 billion for the program's package number two, the construction of a sulfur recovery processing plant. The contract value that the two companies have secured this time equals about a fifth of all overseas contracts won by South Korean construction firms last year. Thanks to these contracts, the total value of overseas construction orders secured as of April 2nd this year has hit over $12.7 billion, more than doubling last year's figure for the same period. The deals also come less than a year after Hyundai Construction landed a $5 billion deal for a petrochemical plant in Saudi Arabia last June. With the domestic real estate market experiencing a downturn, the construction industry is increasingly looking abroad for opportunities. Amid these circumstances, the latest deals are fueling expectations for a second Middle East construction boom. This potential boom harks back to the first one in the 1970s, when Korean construction firms made significant inroads into the Middle East, setting the stage for Korea's rapid economic growth. The presidential office hailed the contract on Wednesday, saying it resulted from President Yoon Song yeols summit diplomacy with Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The two leaders have exchanged visits, with President Yoon making a state visit to Riyadh last October, where an agreement was made to strengthen cooperation and in infrastructure. According to Aramco, Saudi's state petroleum company, the project will increase the Fat Hilly gas plant's processing capacity from 2.5 to up to 4 billion standard cubic feet per day, raising production capacity by more than 60 percent by 2030 compared to 2021. Shin Sebyeok, Arirang News. South Korea's shipbuilding industry has reclaimed the top spot in the value of quarterly global ship orders for the first time in three years, outpacing its Chinese rivals. According to the industry ministry on Wednesday, the total value of ship orders for Korean shipbuilders in the first three months of the year was 13.6 billion U.S. dollars, up by over 40 percent year on year. China recorded over 12 billion dollars. The total value for Korean shipbuilders in the first quarter was nearly half of that recorded during the whole of 2023. South Korea was also ahead of China in terms of the amount of orders made in March alone. The UN administration is planning to earmark 1 trillion won, roughly 740 million US dollars for R&D next year. Speaking to members of the media earlier on Wednesday, Senior Secretary for Science Park Sang-woo claimed the upcoming budget plan would be the government's biggest ever and aims to transform Korea into a first mover in advanced technology, including artificial intelligence, biotech and quantum technology. Plans are also in the works to put in place tangible financial support for scientists as well as efficient review and approval procedures. Shifting gears, with just a week left until the 22nd general election, both the ruling and opposition parties are zeroing in on their efforts on the battleground region of Gyeonggi-do province, known as the Semiconductor Belt. A minor party has also joined the race. Our National Assembly correspondent Shin Ha-young went out and filed this report. Cities with plants run by major chip makers in southern parts of Gyeonggi-do province, known as the semiconductor belt, have emerged as a key battleground for the upcoming election. And Hwasong City, where I'm now, is one of them. Parties have been announcing chip-related pledges and nominating influential candidates in the semiconductor belt. The main opposition Democratic Party has put up Gong young un a former president of Hyundai Motor, as a candidate for the hwasong constituency. Kung pledged to establish a semiconductor and automotive convergence cluster based on his experience leading a global company. I've been part of Hwasong's industrial growth and history, and I'm ready to use my experience to keep pushing forward. The ruling People Power Party selected Han Jung min a former researcher in Samsung Electronics' memory chip department, for the same constituency. Han, who has been living in Dongtan, a town in Hwasong City for a decade, highlighted his ability to address residents' concerns while pledging to establish a human resources development institute for semiconductors and create a stable chip industry environment. 
I will introduce an expanded version of the K-Chips Act. The chip industry is closely related to Dongtan. For instance, last year tax revenue from Awesome City dropped by 300 billion won due to industrial problems. I believe supporting the semiconductor industry is key to Dongtan's development. A three-way race has developed with Lee jun a former PPP chairman and current leader of the newly launched New Reform Party, entering the fray. The average age of residents in Hwasongbi is 34.7 years old, making it statistically the youngest among 254 electoral districts. It's known for having voters who are interested in policies related to transportation and child care. All three candidates have proposed tailored pledges, including initiatives to improve transportation and establish specialized high schools. People in Dongtan are interested to see how the traffic network will expand following the GTX opening. In light of this, we're focusing on projects, including the tramway construction as our policy pledges. With just a week to go before April's general election, all eyes are on which candidate will gain the upper hand in the semiconductor belt, which is considered a pivotal swing region. Shin Ayong, Arirang News. A massive earthquake hit Taiwan on Wednesday, leaving at least nine people dead and hundreds injured. Rescue efforts are underway after a strongest quake to hit the island in 25 years. Our Kim jong shil has the latest. A building in Hualien City leaning dangerously towards the ground shows the power of Wednesday morning's earthquake. The death toll is rising in Taiwan with at least nine people confirmed dead and nearly 900 injured, according to Taiwan's National Fire Agency, on Wednesday evening. At least 26 buildings have collapsed and rescue efforts are underway to save more than 70 people still believed to be trapped. Earlier in the day, Taiwan's weather officials announced a magnitude 7.2 earthquake hit the island at around 8 a.m. The authorities said the quake is the strongest to hit Taiwan in 25 years. The quake caused damage to a major highway as well, with thousands of homes losing power in Hualien, a city of 350,000 residents on the east coast of Taiwan. Authorities said more than 25 aftershocks were registered. The earthquake was so strong that it prompted other countries to issue tsunami warnings as well. Japan alerted people in Okinawa, some 700 kilometers away from Taiwan, to evacuate due to a possible tsunami, the first such warning in Okinawa since 2011. The warning was lifted around noon on Wednesday with no damage reported due to tsunami waves. The Philippines also warned residents in the coastal areas of possible high tsunami waves. It also lifted its warning later on Wednesday. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has officially invited the South Korean president to the NATO summit that will be held in Washington this July. This is the third year in a row that South Korea and three other NATO partners in the Indo-Pacific region have been invited to the summit. Those other partners are New Zealand, Australia and Japan. Speaking to reporters on Wednesday in Brussels, the NATO chief also highlighted how North Korea and Iran were delivering substantial supplies of weapons and ammunition to Moscow, saying Russia's, quote, friends in Asia are vital for continuing its war of aggression. He said this has regional and global security consequences. A day after firing a missile into the East Sea, North Korea confirmed the launch, claiming it was a successful test of a new solid fuel hypersonic missile, ballistic missile, while boasting about its weapons development. The South Korean military sees the North's claims exaggerated. Pei Eunji has more. North Korea has claimed that it successfully test-fired a new type of solid-fueled hypersonic missile. The regime's state-run media said Wednesday that the first launch of the Hwasong-16 intermediate-range missile was carried out the day before. It said the test was overseen by leader Kim Jong-un, who announced the regime has now turned all of its missiles into solid-fueled nuclear-capable ones with independently controlled warheads. The North said the latest test was aimed at verifying the weapon system's reliability and that the missile traveled around 8,000 kilometers. 
However, following the launch, the South Korean military assessed that the missile traveled only about 600 kilometers before falling into the East Sea. It dismissed speculation on Wednesday that the country's radar systems were unable to fully track the missile, saying the North's claims were exaggerated. The military said the latest test appears to have been an early development stage one, although it admitted that Pyongyang appeared to have made some technological progress. The Joint Chiefs of Staff said it would take some time for the North to deploy hypersonic missiles that can maneuver perfectly. Hypersonic missiles can travel at more than five times the speed of sound. A missile expert said their speed and unpredictable flight paths make them very difficult to track and intercept. Since North Korea pledged to develop hypersonic missiles in 2021, it has gone through a lot of trial and error. For the first time, North Korea has tested a specific form of hypersonic missile that it's been aiming for. It will likely test fire the missile two to three more times. He added that the North is likely to start developing hypersonic ICBMs, which are longer-range missiles that are aimed at targeting the U.S. mainland. Developing hypersonic weapons was one of the regime's five main tasks under a five-year military plan announced at the start of 2021. Last month, the regime claimed it had successfully ground-tested a solid-fueled engine, which it said would be used in a new type of hypersonic intermediate-range ballistic missile. IRBMs are capable of targeting places such as Okinawa in Japan, 1,400 kilometers away from Pyongyang, or Guam, which is 3,500 kilometers away. North Korea has been developing solid fuel missiles as they can be launched quickly with little preparation compared to liquid fuel ones. Peunji, Arirang News. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has responded to an Israel Defense Forces airstrike that killed seven aid workers in Gaza, calling it devastating. Amid widespread condemnation from the international community, the Israeli Prime Minister called the attack a mistake. Yoon Jin reports. On Tuesday, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres called an Israel Defense Forces attack that killed seven aid workers the day before unconscionable and devastating, while world leaders have also asked Israel to explain its action. The devastating Israeli airstrikes that killed World Central Kitchen personnel yesterday bring the number of aid workers killed in this conflict to 196 including more than 175 members of our own UN staff. This is unconscionable, but it is an inevitable result of the way the war is being conducted. The World Central Kitchen confirmed on Tuesday that seven of its team members traveling in a deconflicted zone in Gaza were killed. They were in two armored vehicles with the WCK logo visible and an additional vehicle. The strike killed a Palestinian man, as well as citizens of Australia, Britain and Poland, and a dual citizen of the United States and Canada. The aid charity WCK immediately suspended operations at 68 community kitchens where food was being distributed in Gaza. Guterres also said the attack was yet more evidence of the need for a ceasefire. It demonstrates yet again the urgent need for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, the unconditional release of all hostages, and the expansion of humanitarian aid into Gaza, as the Security Council demanded in its resolution last week. The resolution must be implemented without delay. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called the airstrike a mistake, while the Israeli military pledged to conduct an investigation into the incident. Some of Israel's closest allies, including the United States, condemned the attack, with U.S. President Joe Biden saying that it demonstrated that Israel was not doing enough to protect civilians. Ian Jin, Arirang News. In other news, despite the rainy weather, more than 6,000 people gathered on Wednesday to say goodbye to Fubao, the first giant panda born in South Korea. Since early morning, a crowd formed at Everland Zoo where Fuba was born and grew up. Visitors wanted to see the giant panda one last time before she was flown to China later on Wednesday. She was accompanied by her zookeeper for the entire journey on a climate-controlled flight. Major Chinese outlets also sent the reporters to the zoo and live-streamed the emotional farewell scene. Fubao has not only been a symbol of panda diplomacy between Seoul and Beijing, but has also evolved to a cultural icon in Korea.
A country 18,000 kilometers and a 20-hour flight away from South Korea, Argentina has its own kimchi day. One former senator's love for kimchi was all it took for this to happen, and she recently visited South Korea to be a global ambassador. Our Kim Bo-kyung went to see her. Kimchi is an integral part of Koreans' everyday lives, a food that represents national identity. South Korea in 2020 declared November 22nd as Kimchi Day to raise awareness globally about this Korean staple. Ever since then, cities and regions in other countries have declared their own Kimchi Day. But in 2023, Argentina became the first to do so at a national level. This was possible thanks to kimchi lover and former Senator Magdalena Solari Quintana, who led a bill being passed in her country's Senate and House. During her recent visit to South Korea to become a global ambassador promoting kimchi, she cited its health benefits as one of the reasons for its increasing popularity. People in Argentina enjoy beef, so fat intake is very high, so kimchi is a great match. Argentinian people are very interested in health along with the effectiveness of probiotics. This has naturally led to kimchi's popularity. The bill was introduced in the Senate in July 2021, and it took almost two years for it to pass the lower house. Magdalena personally persuaded other lawmakers, and she says her will to show respect to the first-generation Korean immigrant community in Argentina was her motivation. When they settled in Argentina, they tried eating Korean food fused with Argentina's. It is our way to show gratitude towards the Korean immigrant society that's been living here for 60 years. When asked about ways to make kimchi be recognized more, she suggested Korea should look at kimchi in a different way and to actively use Korean roots based in other countries. It's not common to have a dish that everybody, regardless of social class, enjoys. The Korean immigrant community is very well formed in every corner of America. If Korea uses an asset like this, along with social media, kimchi could be recognized more. Hoping that Kimchi Day becomes the foundation for boosting bilateral ties, she vows to make kimchi more well known in Argentina. Kim bo Arirang News. Spring rain has fallen across the nation today. In the central parts of the country, most rain stopped by the afternoon. However, more rain will continue in some southern parts of the country and Jeju Island until tonight. Other than spring rain, strong winds will hit Jeju Island and the south coast. A strong wind warning has been put in place with gusts of more than 20 meters per second until tonight along the coast of Jeollanam-do province. Jeju Island will be windy until early tomorrow morning. Skies won't be clear tomorrow either. Tomorrow morning, the view will be stuffy as thick fog covers the mountainous areas of Gangwon-do province. Please drive safely in the morning in this area. The whole country will be cloudy and raindrops will fall slightly in Jeollado and Chungcheong-nam-do provinces. The weather will be similar to the average for this time of year. Tomorrow, Seoul, Daejeon, and Daegu will start off at 10 degrees. Daily highs will move up to 20 in Seoul and Daejeon, Chuncheon and Daegu, 18 degrees Celsius. Mild spring weather will continue this upcoming weekend. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world.
Well, that is all for this newscast. Thank you for watching. We'll be back at 10 p.m. with the AI headline news. Good night.